What up, what up, what up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you stream your podcast, chopping up about music, chopping up about money, content, the creator economy, entrepreneurship as a whole. And today, talking about entrepreneurship, this first topic is beautiful and unexpected. Very unexpected. This man... And I wish I had his name. This rapper is making $82,000 a year on Fiverr. Fiverr. Now, we can't play the clip because it's like a whole little mini doc and that's just too long. But just breaking down his process and what he's doing. Essentially, he's creating jingles in many cases. Yeah. And in some yeah. cases, it sounds like he's creating personal songs. Yeah. All right. So someone might say. Hey, man, I just want to write a special song for my boo on Valentine's Day. Can you write a song for me? And either he performs it or it seems like there might be some cases where I might be the person performing it. Yeah. Like he just might write it for me. All right. But he's a work for hire. And he said his numbers were, I think it was one hundred and forty dollars for what was it? Like for a 30, no, for 30 seconds or no, 16 bars, yeah, $120, $120 for 16 bars and then $200 for a full song. Yeah. That's a lot of, a lot of music, right? Yeah, there. There's a lot of music, man. Like, I ain't like doing the math. Actually, but. yeah. I wonder how long a full song is, but let's just say this. So it was $83,000 a year, $83,000, all right, divided by $200. I'm sure there's some things give and take that might change, but 415 songs that he wrote, somewhere in that vicinity. That's a lot of writing. But if you're writing every day and you can move fast, that's a great look. Because what this guy said was, it only takes him about 30 seconds to write a song. Mm -hmm. He said, hey, so a client might say, all right, I'll wait these three days that you said that it takes on Fiverr, but it only takes me about 30 seconds. So I guess he comes on in, get inspired. And you got to think, he's not saying, hey, I'm going to write you a song to win a Grammy. And these are regular people. So they're looking for very basic topics that yep. Yep. if you're a really seasoned artist, you could probably damn near freestyle. Yep. Like all of this, and just be done with it. Yeah, reuse some of it. You know what I'm saying? Hey, this person ain't never gonna hear this song. I'm That's like, true. <laughs> I didn't person. think about that. I didn't even think about that. If I had that thing optimized, shoot. Oh, oh, man. So I hate this. We have a topic that got cut out of last episode, and it's not our fault. I know y'all hate when we say that we took an episode down or took something down, I, 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 we've seen the complaints. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to keep quality control. But literally, the audio just cut off mid-episode and we talked for like 12 minutes. And the inspiration was gone. The inspiration was gone. It, it was such a great conversation. It was such a great conversation. And we're going we're gonna to re-have that conversation one day. But <laughs> for now, I'm going to reference the conversation that they didn't get to hear. <laughs> Imagine this. So we talked about the AI bot voice, right? Okay. King okay. Lamar, it was an AI bot. They, like, so now we have the AI that can actually recreate your voice. Imagine me combining this with the Fiverr concept. I could write songs on Jack, chat GPT damn near. Yep, knock them shits out. And knock them all out. Yeah. So bump taking 30 seconds, I'm just going to. Type the concept into Chat GPT. I'd be surprised if he's not doing something like that. This right, point, and then I can have it rap my voice. Oh, with the voice thing. Yeah, actually, oh, that's what he's going. Actually, yeah. So they really think it's me. Yeah, that'd be crazy. Actually, it's a lot of things to combine and streamline. So also, hey buddy, you might want to watch out because yeah. yeah. your job can be be taken possibly real soon. We definitely want to interview him. I want to talk, talk talk to him about that. But the concept of Making money like that on Fiverr is a beautiful concept because artists, I just hear again and again and again and again, y'all are struggling to have this singular version of success, mm -hmm. right? When it comes to music, but there's so many different paths. I'm going somewhere with this because there are thoughts that are flooding into my mind at the moment. It's, 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 some things are, are coming. I'm like, how, how come I didn't see this before? 
Y'all are going this path. This was the path that was sold to us when we were kids, right? We saw the in front of the scenes, not even intentionally, like they were trying to manipulate us, but those were the artists who were in the front of the scenes. That's the vision. You see Jay-Z on stage, Beyonce on stage, Tupac on stage, Taylor Swift, uh, you know, whoever, you know, Garth Brooks. <laughs> He's like, what the hell you say, Garth Brooks? <laughs> you didn't see I that coming. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you see these folks? I saw Garth Brooks. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what you want to be you don't want to be something that you don't see right and now there's a lot of artists who have grown up now they're in a position and they're chasing that singular vision of what they saw even though there's way more to the music industry whether that's composing um music in the back end whether that's doing things specifically like jingles mm -hmm. and writing music for people whether that's just being a songwriter right all of these different things and as of recent, I found out my homeboy, all right, shout out to Nick. Oh, uh, yeah. All right, is actually a rapper for uh, somewhere in the military, because I don't know if I could say that actually now that I'm thinking about it. But shout out to Nick. You know <laughs> what you do. Assassinated. Yeah, you know what I mean? There's a, there's a government, <laughs> there's a government umbrella that is hiring and paying salary to be a rapper almost as a marketing arm. And he's literally rapping, right, for a career, getting paid salary. And yeah, again, I'll leave it at that just because I don't know what I could talk about, but maybe I can interview him. Uh, we can have him on at some point. Now, riding that back, and I'll tell you where it was leading me, though. Corey, I, I feel like. You're familiar with the concept of high value man. Okay. I feel like you've watched Kevin Samuels' videos before. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, very controversial figure. One of the main concepts of this high value man concept was these guys are a very small percentage. Mm hmm of men and they come with certain standards, things you have to do, yeah. things that you might not even want to do. Yeah. Yet most women are chasing that. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not me saying this. This is me repeating his talking points, right? <laughs> That's what people are chasing. In a very similar fashion, Artists are doing the same thing. Okay, I know where this is going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to get you in trouble. I'm not trying to get you in trouble. But if the concept is similar, the perception, right? Because, and that's the funny thing about it, when you actually looked at the definition, it wasn't all. See, I think people got confused by the idea of value, right? Mm. But the the definition was all had to do with more things than value. Like in terms of like whether this is a valuable person, a good person or not, had nothing to do with none of that. Just these superficial things that you look at in these categories, like extrinsic value, right? Exactly. They come with this, and some of that is perception. So if you look at the career, high value music career, there's a perception that people like associated with it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And there's a certain level of exclusivity that comes with. And then there's a certain amount of things that you are going to have to do that many artists say that they don't want to do. Because mm -hmm. that's when we always talk about bringing in the business and the 80% or 90% business and only 10 or 20% music. So now, right? The whole sellout, all that concept. And this isn't me to demonize, this isn't me saying this to demonize following that path and following that dream. It's just me reminding people who want to live as an artist that there are other paths. And I think a lot of people, because initially they wanted that because they thought that was what living as an artist looked like. There is no other option, but there's so many options. There's always been a lot of more than one option, mm -hmm. but now there's even more options. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like that are coming. Like Fiverr, bro, you're writing music on Fiverr. Instead of having to go to a big marketing agency in Jingle Factory before yeah. now, you can go direct that way too. Yeah. Right, so, so I was crazy, but I was just big enough fiber like a couple of days ago. Yeah, you were. Yeah, I was, bro. Team yeah. fiber over here, man. But and I think it's it's one of those things where, to your point earlier, people didn't really know. So like when that Pusha T clip came out about him writing the jingle for McDonald's way oh, back yeah. in the day, yeah. I learned that within the last like 
two, three years. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Um, but that happened what like twenty years ago at this mm-hmm. point. So think about that whole generation of artists that didn't even know that like, they could do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, because the information wasn't out. They thought it was just a joke on Jamie Foxx show. I remember he worked. Yeah. Doing jingles. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> bro. It's like, oh, it's a, it's a real career. Yep. And I, I mean, I remember the first time I personally started to kind of see it was I had a mentor. He's not a famous guy, not even close to being famous. Yeah, he, he has his, you know, his entertainment industry club, but he's not famous. Mm-hmm. And I always remember like one day he just was like, yo, like, you know, come take a look at my my tune court. And he had made like $40,000 in like one month. And I was like, damn, that's crazy. Like. You're not famous, you're not, you know, you're not doing the typical artist things, but there it is right there on your tune core statements for 40, 40 bands, you know what I'm saying, for, for this period. And so that's when I started kind of see like, oh, so there's like different ways to make money in this music thing other than, like you said, the very traditional linear path of ground zero artist to superstar doing superstar things. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially as we've gotten more information about superstars and what they have to do to your point I, I don't even think every artist wants to be a superstar you know because like I said, it's like man i could do this level of work to be super famous or i could do this amount of work and make 200k a year yep i'm going here because this here is easier here's more manageable and here i can leave my house and go to mcdonald's when i feel like it yeah right and so i think that it also makes me think back to the vent staples post did you ever see the vent staples conversation when he talked about how he got into sync for gaming I'm not sure. So he essentially just was making the point of, you know, I think it was like, you know, industry music money was kind of slow and he was just a fan of like certain games. And I think the first big game he got in might've been like FIFA. Okay. And he saw the check from FIFA shit. And he's like, oh, this, this gaming thing shit is like, you know, where it's at. So then he spent like a whole, he talked about, he said he spent like a whole like year, year and a half just like diving into the sync world, researching the people, pitching the different games. He had a good year, but he was on like FIFA, Grand Theft Auto, like a bunch of like really big games. And, you know, that's a path where like he was able to flip his influence into it. But I'm pretty sure there are probably some artists out there where like that's their whole thing. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? It's just like if you watch like anime, there are like music artists in their world who make a living just making music for different TV shows. Like all they do, every time the studio got a new song coming out, they go in the lab, write up a little jingle for him, cut that shit, sell them the rights or give them the rights. And then they on to the next batch. So like there are these like very, very untraditional ways for artists to make money. The, the tour cruise people you told me about like a year ago. Remember you told me about the the, the girl that helps artists get booked for cruises and they be making oh, yeah, the bag yeah, there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to Christine Morell, yeah. Yeah, so like, it'd be all these obscure-ass ways that artists be making money that yep. the artists who are chasing that superstar path either don't know about or they think they're too cool for. Yeah. Now, the latter one yep. is the one I, I've heard a lot, man. It's like, you know, I miss my artists who they would rather struggle on the traditional path than deviate even a little bit to go make some money which i personally think is crazy but they exist you know what i'm saying they, they're out there See, um this is when you ask people about why you want to do this. why you want to do this yeah. what are you really in this thing for because some people say hey i just want to do it for the music do it for the art and i want to make a living but then if you're struggling in one path where you don't have to struggle in another path and still do the music and make a living then it has to be about more which is fine but then be honest with yourself about it yeah. it's like nah Hey, I want to be this type of star. Yeah, but that's why when some artists are try to shame the artist is only in it for money, like oh, he's only in, he or she's only in it for money. I'm like, bro, there are some artists who are only in it to be famous. Now I'd much rather take the artist who's in it only for money rather than the artist who's only in it for fame. You know what I'm saying? Because that yeah. comes with so many other insecurities. I don't even have to hang and, around you, yeah, like exactly. That. So many insecurities and personal demons <laughs> they fighting through that I don't want nothing with. I just want my invoice paid. You know what I'm saying? And the, the artist is all about his money. It's all he care about yeah. or she care about. They're going to they gonna, they gonna take care of that. So, you know, there's a there's a million different ways to get to the same destination as an artist. If, you're, if your destination is to just make a livable income as an artist, right? Mm-hmm. There was a Spotify report that came out like a year ago where they mentioned it was something crazy. I mean, like a very small percentage of artists even making at least 10K a year. So it, even becoming, you know... I. I think for artists, the ultimate goal always seems to be like millions of dollars in fame because they think that puts them above the average artist. But it's like, bro, just making like 30K a year as an artist puts you into like the top 1% of music artists. You know what I'm saying? Shit, making any money really puts you in the top 1%. But you talk about <laughs> making a livable wage. Hey, I ain't like balling, but like I can 
cover a basic apartment and you know cover my bus pass and my groceries off of my music that's a crazy accomplishment and i think sometimes artists don't think about because they look at it as famous fame and rich as the destination not even just you know being able to stay playing the game and i feel mm -hmm. like every artist's first real goal in music should be the first one should be to make money because it's hard to make money in music and I think the second goal should be to make a livable income in music. Once you've done those two things, then the sky's the limit, bro. Go for fame, go for riches, go for whatever you want to go. But if you can, you can't hit those two goals. You know what I'm saying? You got a long, you got a long, long path ahead of you. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. those two things usually come for you know a lot of artists, at least the artists that build foundationally, a lot faster than like the mega fame does. You no, know, like I know artists that have been working for years and like they pay all their bills and off of just music, but they're not like super famous yet. You know what I'm saying? They're still on the way to that. So it's doable, you know what I'm saying? Like after we've, we've seen it. We've talked to clients that are like, you know, you'll talk to them and you get online, like they're not moving crazy, but then they showing you I'm making I'm making six bands a month, you know, I'm making four bands. This ain't, I ain't rich, but this is a, the equivalent to a person with a good degree, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Would they get paid to come out of college and not just make music all day? So yep. yeah, man, the path is different, but there's a lot of different ways to make money in this shit. If you're willing to like, you know, walk the unbeaten paths a little bit 100 percent. let me take a quick second to say if you're an artist trying to blow your music up or if you're a manager a music professional in general trying to help an artist blow their music up i have something that's a game changer for you and it's completely free as you may know, we've helped multiple artists go from zero to hundreds of thousands of streams. We've helped multiple artists go from hundreds of thousands to millions of streams, chart on Billboard, go viral, all of that stuff. And we've now made the way we've branded multiple artists and helped them go viral completely free, step by step in Brandman Network. All you have to do is check out brandmannetwork.com. You apply. It's completely free. But the thing is, we're not going to let everybody in forever. So the faster you apply, the better your chance of getting accepted. Brandmannetwork.com. Check it out. Back to the video. Now, taking that into the next topic, mm -hmm. right? Making money, moving right. The legendary Elton John dropped some game on how he sold out every single show and how you can do it too. Now, I... Got the headlines pretty quick. I could have played bigger venues than I was playing at the start of my career. But Howard said, no, you have to go out and play second on the bill to great artists like Leon Russell and Derek and the Dominoes in areas where you're not so popular. And you have to get the experience of playing to another audience that isn't your audience. Also, when you're in places like New York and Los Angeles and you can sell out big venues, we're gonna put you in smaller venues and create a ticket craziness. So you sell out straight away and no one can get a ticket. That means the next time you come around, you're gonna sell out a bigger venue. If you're good and you're building your career, just take it in stages. And then when you do play big venues, you will really relish it and you will be ready for it. Playing somewhere like that and you're not ready is a disaster waiting to happen. I've been around for a long time, 50 years, and I can tell you, that's the truth. Just take it easy, know what you can do, and then build up to playing something special, but don't do it straight away. Don't. I'm a rocket man. That's your only song you know by? Yeah, well, I'm singing the one with him and your thought. Oh, man, yeah, that's yeah. funny. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> hey, obviously, a lot of game in what he just said key term to me is just patience mm -hmm. right like being willing to go the steps versus just hopping up to something that um just because you can do it because mm -hmm. you rather do it a lot of times than just do it once yeah one big time yeah. one big time yeah. it sounds like whoever he was, was giving him that game was seasoned um i don't know what those people are called but seasoned i guess talent development for tour yep. stuff even a lot of the advice right hey let's not make you the headliner let's put you second to some acts because you need to one get exposed to an audience that's not your audience and two you need to learn how to win over a crowd that isn't your crowd you know what i'm saying things are like you know that's like really good advice in the show world you know because yeah. to his point it's like hey i could feed my ego and go straight for my crowd and kill it but these skills i'll learn from putting myself in these positions gonna, gonna make me a, 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 a give me longevity because you know, anybody can perform in a, in a crowd full of their own fans. Everybody can't perform in front of people that don't know them. You know what I'm saying? Any sure. any artist now that does like showcases and things, you know, you know how hard it is to perform in front of a room full of people that, that aren't there for you. You know what I'm saying? Drake at Camp Vlog? No. 
Great example, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's a hard thing to do. So, but it's a skill set. Like, if you are an artist that's planning on being in this forever, you're always going to run into that wall, right? Like, you're always going to hit the wall of like, hey, I'm performing for someone that's known me. Because even like someone like, like we said, Drake, Drake hit it randomly going to Count Flog. No, he didn't expect that. But then I even think about like, Every time my artist pops up, pops, the first thing they do is take them to like Jay Leno or some night show. Yeah. And you think the people on Jay Leno are listening to Glorilla on a regular basis? No. She got to walk in this, this this building and win over this crowd of people that probably don't listen to her on a, on a regular basis. So even like like the bigger you get or the longer you stay in this, you always going to hit a situation as an artist where you're performing for people that don't know who you are. You know yep. It's going to happen one way or another. So yep. I think it's a valuable skill set to learn. So, yeah, man, he, he was spitting on this, man. The demand part, I think, is crazy, too, because it sounds like he's saying, like, hey, I know I can sell out 5,000, but let's go up probably more than that. Just, I feel like it's disrespectful numbers to him, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I can sell out, I know I can sell out 5,000, but I'm gonna go do 3,000 because I know the 3,000 is gonna sell out, so it's gonna look good for me and my, um and the, the venue. Um, the 2,000 people that could've got in that can't, gonna yep. be anxious about and get into the next one and make sure they cap when the next ticket come around. And I also can still use this opportunity to build a good relationship with the venue and the people that work the venue and the, the promoters in the city and things like that. So when I come back around, my overall experience from promotion to performance is going to be even better because I already built the foundational work to make sure the next one is great, right? So now that 2,000 people that couldn't get in are going to be down to pay a higher ticket price because they couldn't get into the last one and the experience is better. Crazy. I think that's exactly it. Yeah. That's exactly it. Because a lot of people are prone to try to get as much money as they can in the short term. Mm Mm-hmm. But leaving some money on the table, leaving some of that brand equity, allowing that energy to build up mm-hmm. is a long-term play that starts to train your fan base on, hey, man, when I come to town, it ain't nothing to play with. Yeah. Like, people knew when Beyonce tickets went on, oh, these things about to go. Like, one, they knew they were going to be expensive. And they knew that even though when they found out how expensive they were, they still knew that them things were going to sell out. Yeah, You just know in your head. And at some point, there might be moments where it's not necessarily true or selling as fast as you think, but the psychology is already built. Yeah. Right? So establishing that type of behavior that when I say that there's scarcity, it really is scarcity. Right? And now having people experience not being able to get in and even sharing those stories of people not being able to get in low key on the back end. That's what your PR team or your management team might be doing. Then puts out that word when I come to town. Get your shit together. Get your shit together. <laughs> Period. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So now I love all of this. I love all of this. And it goes back to that conversation of people who do want to go the traditional route and go for the big dream and visibility that, hey, yeah, if you want to be that, you are going to have to be, uh, be able to perform in front of different crowds. Yeah. And like you can't get stuck in this circle and cycle of just playing to the crowd that loves you. Yeah, man, because it's dangerous. Like I said, it, it, it stunts your growth. And like, if you are growing as an artist, it's an, it's an unavoidable situation being in mm-hmm. front of people that don't know you. So it's, you know, why not try to learn the skill as, as fast as you can? Because it's the same muscle, man. Like, trying to figure out how to win over a crowd of 10 people that didn't come to this showcase for you is the exact same muscle it takes to win over a crowd of 2,000 people when you open it up Facts. for a bigger artist in the future. You know what I'm saying? Like, exact same muscle, bigger people. Yep. So... Yeah, I mean, and I think that's a that's a underrated like I don't know. I, I think performing skills in general are underrated. Like you know, we always talk about like music development and like overall talent development. I, I feel like in a in a in a different world, man, I should have been a, a performance talent developer, man, because I be seeing the holes in motherfuckers' performance <laughs> strategy, bro. Like, and I, and I was like, I could get you so right, bro. Like, <laughs> but you're not gonna pay me enough for it. But I could do it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But yeah, I would definitely put down the list, bro. Like, like you said, like yo, like let's create long-term demand which is a a long-term play that you got to believe in yourself for because like you said like if i feel like i ain't gonna be here next year no i'm capping right now if i feel like i'm gonna be here in the next five years plus then you're you're doing yourself a great service you know like you're really just helping future you be a lot better and then yeah like we already said like you can never go wrong with learning how to win over some strangers you know that's your whole that's your whole job as an artist yeah (laughs) yeah so 
I mean, no, I think that's it. I might want to add anything <laughs> to that, actually. I might want to add anything to that. Because I'm a rocking man. With that same type of mentality, it alludes to this next clip with Cash Doll. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple different angles when I, when I see this. So I'm going to say it like this. Cash Doll reveals how she played herself early on in her career. Oh, oh, this is executive on the decision, uh, guys, you know, on the fly decision, guys. Oh, <laughs> uh, let, 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 let right. the clip play. I was talking to people in my email flying to other cities myself. Yeah. By myself. Anything could happen to me, but I did all that stuff by myself. I didn't know the business. I didn't know, girl, you could get somebody could come pick you up from this airport and they'll never see you again. Where I am. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Or you got them booking your hotel that can come up in there in the middle of the night. You know what I mean? Or you pulling up to the club talking about some where your back in that they won't give you shit. Yeah. You know, I did it on my own. Cause it's so much it was people around me that loved me that was trying to teach me, but I wasn't ready to hear that. Mm. You gonna be ready when you're ready. And when I finally was ready, that's when I sat there and said, Oh, oh, I gotta pay taxes on that, huh? <laughs> Oh, I was just blowing that shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, shit, damn. Oh, I got to show that on paperwork. I need a paper. I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking I cashed out. That don't mean nothing if you ain't got no credit. Transactions? I was book. All right. That's the clip. Transactions? Now, I was book. see how she did, how she played herself. No, walk me through it. She spoke. I don't even think that she... <laughs> Was speaking from an angle of flex, and most artists have taken this from an angle of flex, and I think there is inspiration here. But I think she was speaking from a, a space and place of being real, including her bad decision making. What she said is, "Hey, I didn't realize that you can go looking looking for your back end on the show and not get that money. All right, you can be in a position, especially her as a woman. All right, where it's dangerous, people can pull up into your whole hotel room, right, or you." Also, get a ride from somebody and you never see that person again. Like some of this stuff, you could tell she was saying, like, nah, like this happened yeah. type of thing. Yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. But then she also said, hey, there were some people who were trying to tell me. Yeah. But she wasn't ready. So this goes to not listening to people who are giving you that advice, who are giving you that game, but you don't want to hear it for whatever reason. Yeah. That's the area that she played herself in. All right. Where it just not taking the pieces of the game and not having your business in order early on when especially today that not for her necessarily when she was speaking for this period but today there's a plethora of advice and things to take on there's only you should only be able to play yourself to a certain extent because of the plethora of information out there right yeah now with that being said the flip side trap star jolene i love that name Com in the comment section said, this makes me understand you really don't need a manager, but you can manage yourself. Now, water, I don't know about need at all, but especially starting out, there's a lot you can handle and people do underestimate how much they can do by yourself. Yes. And that's where you get hella respect for cash, dog. Hey, I'm flying myself out. I'm booking my shows. I'm handling all this stuff. And then, she, of course, she does get the benefit of learning the game her um, in and out on the way up. Yeah, and that's the fun part. Apparently, yes. I personally think that's the fun part. I don't think the fun part is learning the game. I think the fun part is knowing the game after you learned it. <laughs> <laughs> because I went through these experiences, <laughs> right, and saw it inside out. But I don't know. Being inside sometimes it, it ain't necessarily my cup of tea. Now, probably my first show for artists I work with, we booked it through the promoter. We got the car, we drove to Nashville. It was a lot of work, man, but I, I I learned a lot, you know what I'm saying? And now I can use that information all these years later to make me money and, and connections. So, you know, good, good investment. Yes. I would say so. Great yeah. investment. Great investment, yeah. Again, using that, <laughs> getting the investment side, you know what I mean? That OI part of ROI, like that, that actually the R, <laughs> the return on the investment is the best part about it. <laughs> that being up in it, uh, you know, plus you were riding with an artist, you probably had like a little fun, 
You know what I mean? It felt like a moment be on the road. She was just out there thugging it by herself, which much respect to her. Yeah, no, but, that's the crazy part. Cause I ain't know where I would have went to a state for the first time by myself. You ain't got no friends, guys, all like, come on, man. Particularly in her demographic too. Exactly. Like, that says a lot. Exactly. That says a lot. Mm. Now, <laughs> again, with that being said, don't like learn the game into, inside it out. Beautiful. That is something that many artists can do early on, and a lot of artists do not understand how much that they can do by themselves. Mm -hmm. However, she said, hey, yo, some of this stuff I didn't need to learn this way. So you want to get some things vicariously through others. We, there's this mentality that you have to know every single thing that's a part of your business from a practitioner standpoint. But do you believe, you know what I mean, when Jay-Z bought Tidal, that he ever programmed a thing in his life? You know what I'm saying? Probably read a little one pager, got the key points, and was like, okay. All right, and I know <laughs> that's a more extreme example, mm. but I think we have to get accustomed to there are multiple ways of learning, all right? You do things hands-on a lot from the beginning, and you should like do that where you can, but at some point, the scale and it grow quickly, you're not going to be in the weeds of every part of the business mm. that require is required of your new level of business so you have to be able to learn through consultation right so you might learn through hiring a consultant so they can teach you some things and then you have that advice and then you no longer need the consultant because you have seen enough reps and now you can hire somebody and watch them right mm -hmm. or maybe you decide to do it in reverse but really the consultant and weigh in is a good way or you have an advisor or somebody who's watching and they're trusted or whatever or you just hire somebody who is a part of the business or you do like Jay-Z does oftentimes, he will partner with somebody mm -hmm. who's an expert in that space. I don't know real estate, so I'm going to go to the best real estate person in the game. I'm just making something up, right? And we're going to start this real estate company and then I'm going to learn and, and watch what, what he does mm -hmm. and then I'm going to decide, one, do I want to keep going in this game? <laughs> <laughs> or two, do um do I want to just get up out of this? And it's great because I mitigated my risk mm -hmm. by being with somebody who's already in there, and I got and I got a chance to learn yeah. on yeah. somebody else's dime. Well, no, not always somebody else's dime, but I got to learn deeper than, than you'll get just from like an advisory call because I'm in business with them, right? Yeah. Or a Live Nation, like looking at an agreement like that, right? So partnering to hedge some of the bet before you decide to go all the way is a great strategy. She could have probably did that early on. It sounded like she had some people who um, knew some game, but much, much, much respect to her because, you know, she's alive and well today. And, I mean, she did some stuff that most of these artists aren't going to do. Yeah, fast. I'm saying that shit, that shit work, man. Somebody on the other side of it, because it don't sound like a lot like booking your own hotel, and, but there's so many other nuances that go into it. Yep. You're thinking about distance from – from hotel to venue and things mm -hmm. you want to do and what's that going to make the Uber cost be and yep. you know Don't what, put, a lot of little things that, that kind of go into it which I think to the anti point of that comment is why I don't think every artist should take that route like you know sounds messed up man but all of y'all aren't crazy organized some of you are, organization is not your strong suit mm -hmm. some of you guys the girls communication is not your strong suit some of you guys or girls, money management isn't your strong suit, right? A lot of little different factors that I would still point and say, like, hey, artists need a manager at some point, right? I'm assuming she's talking about early stages of her career, like before yeah, she, she was, was probably somebody. And artists at that stage where you don't really have anything going on, yeah, you could do all this. We actually got a client. It's actually funny. One of our clients did DM me like a week ago and was like, yo, I'm thinking about making a fake management email for myself. Should I do it? And I was like, yeah, go for it. You know what I'm saying? Like, finesse these motherfuckers so they find out. You know, let let them learn that you don't have a manager when you don't pull up to the show to collect their money. Let that be when they <laughs> figure out that you don't have one. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Um, but if that client keeps moving and, and growing as he should, then it's gonna be a point where it's like, hey, it doesn't make sense if you be doing any of this because you're, you're like to your point, your return on investment is dwindling at this point from you handling this thing. We in the beginning and nothing is going on, return on investment is massive because you're not paying people for nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like you're learning things um, that you just didn't know. You're, you're, it's giving you cool stories to talk about in your in your fader interview, you know, five years from now. But then once you like Drake or something, not, let's not even let's not even take that stream. Once you like who's a good like artist that's not Drake level. Let's say 
because we talked about Key Glock last episode. Let's say you Key Glock, right? Key Glock ain't Drake level, but he's big. He, he has a, a, a massive audience. Mm-hmm. Does it make sense for Key Glock to be booking his own hotels and calling his own Ubers and and routing his own tours and collecting his own money? Hell no, because the risk that he is putting himself in as an artist is not worth the money that he's that he's saving for doing those things. You What's know what the saying? risk? Well, artists in his demographic are getting hurt. You know what I'm saying? Um, being put in a situation where someone can can. Yeah, just hurts you. You know what I'm saying? Which if you out the game, then we all lose a job. You know what I'm saying? The whole infrastructure fall apart. Yeah. Um, I think time management, right? Hey, it's gonna take you 30 minutes to scroll through Airbnb to find the perfect Airbnb for all of us. But in that 30 minutes, you could have wrote a verse or, you know what I'm saying, responded back to an artist we need you to collab with or went live on Instagram and talked to your audience or, or responded to comments. Right. So then the the, the usage of time becomes more valuable in certain areas than, than in others, right? Because like I said, if I'm Key Glock's manager, I would much rather you be responding to comments than booking Airbnb. It's just like, no, that's what we got an intern for. Sorry, like, go back yeah. to doing the part of your job that keeps this whole operation going, you know? And so I think there's a point where early in the artist's career, it makes sense to kind of balance those things. You don't have enough, you don't have enough going on on either side to where you realistically can't do both of those things. Right. But there becomes a point where it doesn't make sense for you to do all of it and something has to start getting cut out. Which, you know, to the point of the artist, there's some artists who might be like, hey, I like booking my own Airbnbs for whatever reason, but I don't know. I don't like carrying, being the one to take the equipment to the to the venue. So I'd much rather get somebody to handle that for me and go handle setup and all that stuff. So, you know, to each their own, but I do think there's that diminishing return on the, doing the things to save money and time in the beginning that like eventually you have to kind of look at it and go, like, OK, it makes more sense for me to put my time in other places um, because of what's going to happen for that. But, yeah, like I said, you rising, you growing. There's no reason you should you, like you should be doing all this stuff and going through the weeds to see how it turns out. Like I said, my very first show like it was a Nashville show for the artists I was managing. Like we booked it. We drove there, you know what I'm saying? We booked the Airbnbs. We we did all that shit. And I learned a lot about doing that. That at one point in time made me feel like I could ride a tour. I'm like this isn't that hard. You know what I'm saying? I could I could I could I could do this eight times, you know what I'm saying? Or yeah. fifteen times or whatever. Um, but it was like looking back on it now, like I said, there's so many things I learned from that, those first few situations doing that that I can apply today. So that's why I said if you're a growing artist, bro, do it just to get the reps in and get the information. Once you are beyond that that beginning artist phase, don't do that shit. Hire somebody to do it for you. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I can rock with that. Now, let's switch it up to this clip right here because Miss Fantasia, she she airing it out, mm. unfiltered. But we're gonna let Fantasia talk on that because she's talking about her own personal experience. Do you have more money than we have, Fantasia? You don't know that. <laughs> okay. A lot of a lot of artists that you see, they look like they have it. And we smile and we come out and we put on a good show. But in real life, some of them are struggling mm. and we don't have it. I'm just now building myself back up. I lost everything twice. Mm. Yeah, but you have more money than we have, Fantasia. You don't know that. <laughs> just needed you to hear that one more time. Mm-hmm. You don't know that. Mm-hmm. Get out of my pocket, shawty. It was mm-hmm. some you got more money than we have. Right. Like, what? I mean, she's like, that's the point I'm trying to make. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You just assuming and me saying that, hey, I don't have money or it's harder. Uh, but you got more money. That's the crazy part about this perception, right? Mm-hmm. Because we always look at classism and think about top down, but there's so many people who are top up classes thinking, oh, your problems don't matter because you got more money than me. And then when it comes to a lot of these situations, the more artists celebrity type situations a lot of times they might not yeah like you don't know right they so the interesting part about this like she said hey man i I done went broke went to zero a couple times and had to bounce back figure my way back (laughs) and don't say i got more money than you because you don't know what i got yeah now we've heard plenty of real situations where artists that are notable are broke Right. And I think we think about the the ones that have come and gone or you see some story like uh, what happened to that artist and how they go broke with all that money that they made in that short period of time. But what people miss is the Kanye West saying, I'm broke. 
See, Kanye so Kanye, people don't even believe Kanye or process Kanye when he says it. Yeah. It's like, no, when he said he was broke, he meant it. Like, you just like, oh, yeah, but you're still rich. Yeah, he might be broke on a more expensive lifestyle, but to produce at the level and what he's trying to accomplish, he's broke. Yeah. I need some money. Bank loan me some money. Mark Zuckerberg, please, sir, give me some money. Like, however, then there's some other artists that aren't out there, so I'm not going to put them out there, right, that, you know, have been behind the scenes and heard certain people talk who are closer to these artists that are well known and they too are broke or they've been living off of label deals only. All right. So it's like, is that really a lot of money? Like, let's just say you get 10 mil from a label deal. Yeah, that's a lot of money. But if you're only living off of that and we know that that money has to be paid back. So Yes, you're living a ten million dollar lifestyle, but when that ten million life, ten million dollar lifestyle is alone, are you broke or are you not? It's like you're standing on the uh, on, on tight the ground. ground is crumbling. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. crumbling ground. So like, what's yours really ain't yours because it's all alone. So these people are building some perception, but they really can't cash in. And there's artists who finally escape that velocity. But I think we, we underestimate how high you have to jump yeah. to get over that damn hill. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you're like, oh yeah, you could be a legendary artist in your uh, generation, killing it. And nobody has a, a doubt that you got money, but you really don't have money. Yeah. And you're just lucky because you got that perception because I could put on a fake chain and no one would ever think it's fake because yeah. I'm me. Yeah. Which is also great and smart on your part. I'm not I'm not against that at all. Hey, rock all the fake chains. You know, save your money while building the perception for these these folks. But on the other side, that messes with you mentally because the world thinks you, you have this and you don't have this and you know that you're running, you know, on crumbling ground. Yeah, bro. Uh, I, I remember um like maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, listening to this TikToker speak on Clubhouse about how he was catching like this massively viral moment, like, you know, jumped up to like 5 million followers or something. And But he was still working at like a clothing store in LA, like broke, you know what I'm saying? People would come like, you're the guy from, you're the guy from TikTok, right? You're the guy, I love your videos and blah, blah, blah. And like how much it just will fuck with him because mm-hmm. he's like, man, like, you know, like I should, be, I should be better than this situation I'm in right now. Like shit's moving for me. And one thing too was actually kind of crazy about it is like how much the industry itself helps that. Now I guess not help, but like aids that, right? Because if you think about an artist in a situation like Fantasia, getting free travel, more than likely, right? Hey, we want you here, so we're gonna bring you out. So hey, you hop on this jet, you look lit, Saint your shit, right? Or you getting free clothes from sponsors, so you wearing all the best shit. Mm-hmm. It looks good, right? But you didn't really have to pay for it. So I think that there are certain things that come afforded with the superstar lifestyle that right. helps trap them in that perception right yeah. cuz like people naturally want to give you free things and put you in things and you know lots of companies would much rather pay you in product than exposure than an actual check you know what i'm saying especially yeah, you have more it doesn't money change the bigger you get you know people think that's a issue that only small creators have like no that's an issue everybody has hey man your audience is worth 5 million can i just give you a car you know what i'm saying like can i just give you a car and like mm-hmm. a chain and we call it even you know what i'm saying so, <laughs> so it happens at all. I'd be so damn offended someone tried to prove that shit on me, but that's just me. Where like I what? am, my age. Kind of car, a Honda Accord, Bugatti, <laughs> maybe, maybe. It's a, a, a car that can be flipped and yeah, for maintain the same value because it has that culture. Yeah, that's different. I was just thinking about the chain specifically. Oh yeah, the chain is super disrespectful. <laughs> Cause, bro, it, to me, it's like I pay you with a chain. But when, when somebody put that shit on you and you're not even a rapper, it just like, sir, that is racist. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say that. I got this, I got this chain. <laughs> you can't offer that to me. Because I would be mad because it's like, man, you are willing to help me look the part, but not willing to actually help me be the part. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, you are willing to help me yes. look rich, but you will not help me become rich. That is a fact, sir. Yeah, I Helping don't... you be the part takes more away from me. It's a lot easier for me. <laughs> Helping to help you me look, look the part brings more to me. Exactly. Because every other artist watching like, man, now I want to change. 
not knowing, hey man, this motherfucker, this motherfucker couldn't get the chain. You know what I'm saying? Like he exactly. only got it because I fucked with him and I threw it to him for a ninety percent discount or to be on my YouTube channel or whatever that looks like. So man, and I know we talk about it, man. It's, it's really only an issue that seems like rappers and pop artists have to deal with is like that perception of being more grandiose than you really are. So I feel like they're the ones that fall into the trap the most. Yeah, you know, I don't think other like I don't, I ain't never heard a country artist complain about those type of things or like a house music Hell yeah artist. man that's what i love about that bro yeah they didn't build that culture hey, they be wearing the same brown shoes and boots jeans. that everybody else wear yep the jeans flash, the flash shirts from target. Shirts. they might get a little <laughs> bit more expensive but they only get so much more expensive country artists drop bags on their belt buckles and their shoes i learned that once i must met a country artist who like his belt crazy he had to draw like 20 bands on it flexing yeah Flexing. It was like flexing in his world. It was like the hat, the belt, and the shoes. See? Everything else basically. So it does get spent a little bit. Yeah. I mean, right? I, mean I got to drop some money. I guess, I guess every artist got that itch in them. You know what I'm saying? To, yeah. to spend it. Yeah, but I mean, everybody, when they get money, a lot of the, people spend it on something. Yeah, but only two, like two, three genres specifically, careers bank on it. You know what I'm saying? Right, like, that's a fact. Yeah. <laughs> so, career, like, like yeah. their careers are literally, do, like, as a pop artist, your career is defined by, like, how opulent can you be. As a rapper, your career is definitely defined by how opulent you can be. Even artists a that don't. Specific type of rapper. Yeah, but even the ones that don't want it, like J. Cole, for example. I was just talking to somebody about this the other day. Do you remember. When J. Cole did that collaboration with Bally, the shoe, the shoe brand. I forgot about that. Long ass time ago, because the shoe was yeah. ugly as fuck. It was ugly and it was expensive and it was outside his demographic, especially at that time. And I was like, who on J. Cole's team told you him like, hey, we need to partner with a high-end shoe company and sell these $600 shoes to your fan base that's buying a dollar in a dream tour tickets. <laughs> You created the wrong funnel. Like who put that together? You know, yeah. so but I always thought it was interesting. Like, man, even an artist ain't like that bad, man. I'm shit ugly. These ain't that bad, man. Ugly, I done bro. seen people wear plenty uglier for more hype. <laughs> they just didn't put enough hype beats around but, it. But J. Cole ain't exactly. Jay, I was just about to say that. J. Cole is not the artist that can convince me to wear ugly I, clothing. I was about to say, bro. <laughs> like this whole game is about convincing people to wear ugly clothes and thinking it's cool. Oh, bro, that shit was like fucking lugs. The glossy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna put this on the screen. And, 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 yeah, please, man. Please, so everybody can be on my side. No, bro. <laughs> this is not ugly enough. The, the, I don't remember nobody buying them. That, I, ain't okay. seen, I ain't seen that. That's the marketing machine. Kanye's oh, convinced man. people to wear far uglier than this. It was wrong demographic, wrong. Like, J. Cole fans aren't wearing bellies, you know what I'm saying? Like, especially yeah, sometimes when these came out, like, what year these came? Can you click on that one of them and see what year these came out? Let's see. This had to be like 20, like 15 or 16 or something. Let's see. Is he going to show? August 2015. 2015, bro. Yep. I was currently getting kicked out of college. <laughs> And I remember looking at this and being like, I don't have six hundred dollars for this. Who the fuck does J. Cole think see, he's talking to? See, that's what it is, man. I hear it. I hear it. <laughs> the ugly comes from that hate. <laughs> he can't get them, so he called them bitches ugly anyway. It's like the dude who don't get the girl. She walk away, man. I ain't want your old ugly ass. Oh, God, anyway. man, hey, man. hey, that's what that's what it is. I don't want no ugly ass shoes, no. old lugs, some glossy ass. That's all you're doing, bro. Come on now. No, man. come on now. That's just ugly. I'm sure a lot of lugs. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. Like, but it was interesting that even an artist like J. Cole, like yeah. with his brand archetype, still felt the need to jump into the high end space. So, and mm. that's a rap thing in general. Like every rapper feels like at some point they have to cross over in a high end fashion. I, I just, I wish y'all was. There's so many other verticals y'all could do that with. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't have to always be fashion. I feel like dentistry and like. Forestry needs y'all. You know what I'm saying? Like, it could be a lot of money made off of like making like a deforestation build business or something. So, I don't know, man. Something, man. But, um, so yeah, so those genres I think get impacted by the most. They have to deal with the most. But, yeah, yeah, man, like it I sucks. Agree. It sucks being an artist like trapped in this, trapped Flash, in this character that you built for the world. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like almost like you just knocking on glass eyes. Like, oh, this ain't me. We just like nah, bro. Like I just seen your last music video, bro. You had on the, you had on the a, a ten thousand dollar like Gucci Gucci shirt. You good? As far as I'm concerned, I don't want to hear none of that shit. Yeah, this is how fans react to it, bro. As soon yep. as you are, you start complaining, nigga. You just I just seen you at, at mm -hmm. a, on a clip on the shade room throwing fifty bands at the strip club. You want me to feel bad for you? This was like the interview with Fantasia. Fantasia, you got more money than me. Bro. She's like, 
Like she had to say, hold up, man. Like, you don't know that. Yeah, get man. the fuck out of my pockets, bro. And that <laughs> don't mean that this shit still don't hurt. Just because you ain't never lost five million don't mean that losing five million don't hurt. I don't know if that's a number. I'm just saying that. But you know what I'm saying that it's, don't mean it don't hurt. This is the thing, bro. <laughs> so it's a couple things. One, you don't know if I have more money than you. Yeah. Two, people always judge off of their personal context. Yeah. Like you said, you don't. All right, maybe you can say I got 500k and you only got 50k, mm. but you don't know what it's like to go from 50 million to 500k. Yeah. And feel that pain. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But that's what I uh, look. It always comes down to this. People don't really give a fuck about most of the stuff they complain about or pretend to have empathy for. All right. It's all about their personal experience. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so people don't care. Oh, this rich kid is complaining about something. But you got to realize the context. If he's only been rich in his life and he feels X pain, it's contextual to his experience. That's real for him. It's real for him. <laughs> yeah. Why your stuff. <laughs> All right, it's real for you. You feel like, oh, that's a great position to be in. Well, you ain't been in that position yet. You don't, and that's only gonna be so great because it's coming from where you came from. But there's probably someone who had it worse than you and wouldn't complain about your stuff. All right. So like people spew all this stuff like they do on social media or and all that stuff. But the reality is people care way more about a paper cut on their finger than they do a, a child in a sweatshop across the, the world. It's facts. It's facts. In that moment, it's facts. You know, you, yeah, you got all this stuff you say you complain about, but in that moment you get that paper gut. Ah, that's all you think about. As Man. small as that pain might be contextually, you care about your your, your own. And I, I, I mean, I think as a musician, they they get the the worst of that because you have people who are giving you rich people dismissiveness mm -hmm. when you don't have rich people experience on the back end yeah it's crazy too bro it comes as soon as you start cracking like a million views on anything it's like oh this nigga must be paid yep fuck you and your rich your rich nigga problems like yeah. oh bro like what yep. <laughs> <laughs> well this is just a job people forget this is still just a job man, in I, many ways but i kind of feel it though man i told the story on a different episode about the first time i ever seen a rapper like check his bank account in public that did, oh, yeah. that did fuck me up too man it like it I just it. it just shattered my whole reality that's the bro. illusion working right yeah yeah, yeah. that's the illusion <laughs> working but but man you know we got a mature past that allow <laughs> a lot of these artists to be you know real people yeah. spread their wings i remember august alcina talking about people asking him for money and he was like, bro, my mom still live in the hood. Like, I haven't seen a check yet. Like, yeah. I actually haven't seen it. Yeah. <laughs> like, you have to worry about me giving you money. It's like, my mom's still living in the hood. I have not, like, gotten myself into a better position. Yeah. Yeah, bro. Shit crazy. Shit be sad. But it's the hole they dig themselves in. <laughs> <laughs> Just know that's what comes with it. <laughs> that's, that's what comes with it. Now, on the other news. Oh, this is the irony of it, actually. Yeah, but you have That's more. why I laughed. That's why I looked at it. I looked at the screen and was like, oh. Yeah, but you have we more. Gotta, we got to get into some of these comments real quick, right? So, you know, facts, you break even and you're killing it, really. Social media presents massive or nothing. But the reality mm -hmm. is if you can make a living off of music and pay your bills and eat off of it, just wow. Nice. Recognize how amazing that is. You didn't have to say that. Appreciate you. For All right. Whoever that was. Black's Hippie says... Got to be a hustler outside of music if your music hit one bonus. What? No, hit one day and becomes lucrative. That's a bonus. But music isn't lucrative for majority of artists. Do it for the love. Yeah, actually made a really good point. She does come from a different era of music artists where like they weren't really mm -hmm. super capping the way artists today do because the label owned everything. So exactly. that's, a great, that's a great point. Actually. Exactly. Yeah. Don't let what you see deceive you. There's a lot of behind the scenes that we don't see. Longevity in this music game requires a lot of effort. Now, there was one person. What do they say? Y'all keep telling the truth. People won't listen and be more specific with names because if at least one of the people on playlists don't really got it, I will be very surprised. I don't know what playlist is. I'm guessing you mean regular playlist. So she just want her to start calling out broke artists. Yeah, <laughs> which is why am I gonna call out other people who are yeah. broke? That's messed up. Why yeah. am I gonna like put them out there like that? But it's funny. The artists she's talking about are taken care of. They don't have it. There's one person that they say. That's what I'm. Th Damn sure ain't talking about Pluto. I know that for sure. Never gonna be talking about. Never Pluto. be talking about Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what brings us to the next topic. Because that man, Pluto, 
said Last year I was- he dropped 250 bands to break his music. Keep that in mind. So yeah, she would dare show one talking about Pluto. She want to talk about Pluto. <laughs> Last year I was getting 3,500 a show at this time. And this year I'm getting 20 because I always wanted to see myself go up the hill. Nigga, I did this shit in a year. If you really on your grind, man, it can happen. Only thing you gotta do is believe. So when I'm throwing numbers, I'm throwing numbers for the dude who ain't getting the 20 a show, who trying to get it to let them know it didn't take me nothing but a year. But only thing, it did take a lot of hard work. It took 24 hours being in the studio. It took my girl being mad at me. It took me not being around my kids like I want to be. It took me doing interview after interview. It took me doing phoners. It took me doing drops for different DJs. It took me to go to the club, throwing goddamn over a quarter million, just blowing it every time I go in the club, making that impression, making sure everybody on the music and, and doing it for a cause. You got a hot song, you get whatever for it. You know what I'm saying? So really, I went and spent my money, my own money out of my pocket every time I go into the club. It took a lot to get that 20. It just didn't come just from me just rapping in the studio. Then the next day I performed and they told me they was gonna give me 20. Last year I was getting 30. It's crazy, bro. He literally is the the anti and anti to the last topic. Cause he like, hey man, you know what I'm saying? I'm selling this audience this this, this rich lifestyle before I got it and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair. He's spending it wisely for what his brand is, yeah. right? Yeah. So we talk about some of these artists being broke and not having the money. Well, what are they spending it on? Him, his was specific path. He was spending it to make more money. Yeah. His goal was to go from 3,500 a show to 20K. Yeah. And he did that in a year doing exactly what he just said. Yeah. So yes, his audience, we know that a part of the perception is throwing money in the club, right? Making shit look lit. But that cre- but that's marketing, yeah. right? So he was spending money on marketing while in some of these cases, you're just talking about straight up maintaining lifetime and perception, which is it's like, it's such a fine line, yeah. right? Such a fine line. And Fantasia's demographic, I don't think would benefit from that perception like Futures would, yeah, right? So that's a whole nother thing. There's a lot of artists who are caught in that loop, who don't get a direct impact and um, level of growth from appearing to be rich. Yeah. Futures, yeah, you know, and then the type of music you got, like, come on, it's, it's, that's what it is. And that's the environment that he wants his music to play in. Mm-hmm. You know, you're throwing it in a strip club. I want it to play in a strip club. So I'm setting the tone, setting the experience. So it's, it's a little bit different, but I think bigger than that is j- just, his mentality, he's talking about even the sacrifices that, that he made. You know, I know a lot of people like to be like, hey, future got a lot of kids. And I like to kind of give him like a fuckboy um, brand. But hey, he said this right here is early on. I don't want to miss my kids. I mean, I'm not, not be with my kids, but I got to work. He talked about it as a sacrifice, which I think I feel like men kind of like get. Um, what word am I looking for? Like dissed for that a lot, mm-hmm. like the like entrepreneurial. Yeah, man, it's like no, just because I made the decision to do this, it don't mean that I don't miss the yeah. thing that I'm not doing. Yeah, I might, I really want to be at that birthday. This hurts me too. You think you're the only one hurt? Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. So, for those people who are inspired by that and need to, you know, get that understanding that you are gonna have to miss some of those things, and you're gonna have to have some of those discussions, which actually lead a lot back to what we were talking about before we started the pod. Oh, yeah. but that's just a little too deep for today. We, you know, we're gonna wait till the brain expands a little bit more. <laughs> it's it's a real thing. There's moments that you miss. Yeah. Right. So, like the way future moves, like people said, couldn't have been Pluto. I think it's very clear. Which is why we questioned. I think that was last pod why we were like future wouldn't turn down a million dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's very much so about his money and very strategic. Although people wouldn't give future smart, a lot of people wouldn't think smart just because of his brand. Yeah, you assume at the same time you're not assuming stupid. Yeah, but just being a street artist for for whatever reason, like Jay Z is like the only one. They came out with a brand of people thinking he's smart from any kind of like street hustle. Yeah, that's true. 
I think I think Future's brand is getting better because I think the more people start to learn about like how long he's really been around. Yeah. You know, because it, it's surprising. But I saw this thread on Instagram the other day that was like just songs that were written by artists and you didn't know it. And like, bro, it was, it was going through like Future on there, bro. Future wrote some stuff back in the day that I didn't even realize he was in the music industry yet. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, and, and it's like, bro, like old Ludacris songs. He's in like the video for like Bubba Sparks and this new boo. Like a point in time, I didn't even know, I didn't even know he was in the music industry yet. Cause you know, I feel like for most like Future fans, like he started to appear for me around, you know, I don't know, probably like, well, Racks, you know what I'm saying? When Racks first came out. Mm. That was the first time I ever heard of Future. Was that shit came out, you know? And that was like so 2000, small. like 11, 10, 11, something like that. You know what I'm saying? Mm, uh, yeah, definitely like 2010, yeah. 11-ish. So it's like, to, so like you said, bro, to be an artist that was like, let's 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 do like, the one he wrote was like Blueberry Yum Yum by Luda. That was the one I learned about. That's like 2004. So to be from 2004 to 2011, seven years of career, that's already impressive. Yeah, and then to go from that 2011 to today, which is another 13 years, that's also impressive. Like all oh, that shit is crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like when you think about yeah, it, this like, industry especially. Yeah, but remember, he came up with the Dungeon Family. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so, like being around, you know, that different. He wasn't technically in in, but he saw some different things, and he that probably is what allowed him to navigate yeah. and get that game. He just doesn't present like the rest of the yeah. that Dungeon Family. You know, so people. Don't know where you came from because you're not presenting like where you came from, and that's what shocks them. Yeah. Because then, if you think about what Future does, and again, because of the category he's in, him, the they did, originally when they first came out, they didn't get the respect for the creativity that they had. It was just like, oh, what's this mumble rapper? Or like, you know, a lot of people got thrown in that category when it wasn't even all the same, right? And like, what is this? They're just making noise, da da da. But then if you rewind and then you say, hey, some of his lineage is Dungeon Family. And then you look at a Andre and a C- CeeLo and people like that. Mm-hmm. You know, then you, you sprinkle it with some street shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just like get me talking about it. Like, I mean, we were street dudes, a lot of us. And or we had street things going on, but we just didn't talk about that in our music. Mm-hmm. So it's just like you you repackage the same type of creativity. So if you know future, I would love to see his story when that one come out. Yeah, but his documentary gonna be crazy. His would be dope. Yeah, his like be his crazy. would be dope. But, but yeah, man, look, like he said, some cases artists spending money in this, and that perception is making them go broke. Some of them are spending to win, and it actually is helping them level up. But I think there is like just a fine line in how you do it. Strategic. Brand spending is what it's about. Like yes. I said, like I'm going to buy this ten thousand dollar outfit because I have two shows and an appearance that I can make while I'm making that money back. Versus, I'm going to buy this ten thousand dollar outfit to sit in the house. Facts. One's going to help you go up. The other's just going to fuck you eventually. You know what I'm saying? And so that's why I got it up. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll leave it at that for today. <laughs> I'm Redman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we out. Peace. Peace.